This is Chapter 8 of Huckleberry Finn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain, Chapter 8. Sleeping in the Woods, Raising the Dead, Exploring the Island, Finding Jim, Jim's Escape, Signs, Balaam. The sun was up so high when I waked that I judged it was after eight o'clock. I laid there in the grass and the cool shade thinking about things, and feeling rested and rather comfortable and satisfied. I could see the sun out at one or two holes, but mostly it was big trees all about, and gloomy in there amongst them. There was freckled places on the ground where the light sifted down through the leaves, and the freckled places swapped about a little, showing there was a little breeze up there. A couple of squirrels sat on a limb and jabbered at me very friendly. I was powerful lazy and comfortable, didn't want to get up and cook breakfast. Well, I was dozing off again when I thinks I hears a deep sound of boom, way up the river. I rouses up and rests on my elbows and listens. Pretty soon I hears it again. I hopped up and went and looked out at a hole in the leaves, and I see a bunch of smoke laying on the water a long ways up, about abreast of the ferry. And there was the ferry boat, full of people, floating along down. I knowed what was the matter now. Boom! I see the white smoke squirt out of the ferryboat's side. You see, they was firing cannon over the water, trying to make my carcass come to the top. I was pretty hungry, but it weren't going to do for me to start a fire, because they might see the smoke. So I sat there and watched the cannon smoke and listened to the boom. The river was a mile wide there, and it always looks pretty on a summer morning. So I was having a good enough time seeing them hunt for my remainders, if I only had a bite to eat. Well, then I happen to think how they always put quicksilver in loaves of bread and float them off, because they always go right to the drowned carcass and stop there. So, says I, I'll keep a lookout, and if any of them's floating around after me, I'll give them a show. I changed to the Illinois edge of the island to see the, what luck I could have, and I weren't disappointed. A big double loaf come along, and I most got it with a long stick but my foot slipped and she floated out further. Of course, I was where the current set in the closest to the shore. I knowed enough for that. But by and by along comes another one, and this time I won. I took out the plug and shook out the little dab of quicksilver and set my teeth in. It was baker's bread, what the quality eat, none of your low-down corn-pone. I got a good place amongst the leaves and sat there on a log, munching the bread and watching the ferry-boat and very well satisfied. And then something struck me. I says, now I reckon the widow or the parson or somebody prayed that this bread would find me, and here it has gone and done it. So there ain't no doubt, but there is something in that thing. That is, there's something in it when a body like the widow or the parson prays, but it don't work for me, and I reckon it don't work for only just the right kind. I lit a pipe and had a good long smoke and went on watching. The ferry-boat was floating with the current, and I allowed I'd have a chance to see who was aboard when she'd come along, because she would come in close, where the bread did. When she'd got pretty well along down toward me, I put out my pipe and went to where I fished out the bread, and laid down behind a log on the bank in a little open place, where the log forked I could peep through. By and by she come along, and she drifted in so close that they could have run out a plank and walked ashore. Most everybody was on the boat, Pap, and Judge Thatcher, and Bessie Thatcher, and Joe Harper, and Tom Sawyer, and his old Aunt Polly, and Sid, and Mary, and plenty more. Everybody was talking about the murder, but the captain broke in and says, "'Look sharp, now. The current sets in the closest here, and maybe he's washed ashore and got tangled amongst the brush at the water's edge. I hope so, anyway.' "'I didn't hope so. They all crowded up and leaned over the rails and nearly in my face and kept still, watching with all their might. I could see them first-rate, but they couldn't see me. Then the captain sung out, "'Stand away!' and the cannon let off such a blast right before me that it made me deaf with the noise and pretty near blind with the smoke, and I judged I was gone. If they'd a had some bullets in, I reckon they'd a got the corpse they was after. Well, I see I weren't hurt, thanks to goodness. The boat floated on and went out of sight around the shoulder of the island. I could hear the booming now and then, further and further off, and by and by, after an hour, I didn't hear it no more. The island was three mile long. I judged they had got to the foot, 
and was giving it up. But they didn't yet a while. They turned around the foot of the island and started up the channel on the Missouri side, under steam, and booming once in a while as they went. I crossed over to that side and watched them. When they got abreast the head of the island, they quit shooting and dropped over to the Missouri shore and went home to the town. I knowed I was all right now. Nobody else would have come a-hunting after me. I got my traps out of the canoe and made me a nice camp in the thick woods. I made a kind of a tent out of my blankets to put my things under so the rain couldn't get at them. I catched a catfish and haggled him open with my saw, and towards sundown I started my campfire and had supper. Then I set out a line to catch some fish for breakfast. When it was dark I sat by my campfire smoking and feeling pretty well satisfied, but by and by it got sort of lonesome, and so I went and sat on the bank and listened to the current swashing along and counted the stars and drift logs and rafts that come down, and then went to bed. There ain't no better way to put in time when you are lonesome. You can't stay so. You soon get over it. And so for three days and nights. No difference. Just the same thing. But the next day I went exploring around down through the island. I was boss of it. It all belonged to me, so to say, and I wanted to know all about it. But mainly I wanted to put in the time. I found plenty strawberries, ripe and prime, and green summer grapes, and green raspberries, and the green blackberries was just beginning to show. They would all come handy by and by, I judged. Well, I went fooling along in the deep woods till I judged I weren't far from the foot of the island. I had my gun along, but I hadn't shot nothing. It was for protection. Thought I would kill some game nigh home. About this time I mighty near stepped on a good-sized snake, and it went sliding off through the grass and flowers, and I after it, trying to get a shot at it. I clipped along, and all of a sudden I bounded right on the ashes of a campfire that was still smoking. My heart jumped up amongst my lungs. I never waited for to look further, but uncocked my gun and went sneaking back on my tiptoes as fast as ever I could. Every now and then I stopped a second amongst the thick leaves and listened, but my breath come so hard I couldn't hear nothing else. I slunk along another piece further, then listened again, and so on and so on. If I see a stump, I took it for a man. If I trod on a stick and broke it, it made me feel like a person had cut one of my breaths in two, and I only got half and the short half, too. When I got to camp, I weren't feeling very brash. There weren't much sand in my crawl. But I says, this ain't no time to be fooling around. So I got all my traps into my canoe again so as to have them out of sight, and I put out the fire and scattered the ashes around to look like an old last year's camp, then clumb a tree. I reckon I was up in the tree two hours, but I didn't see nothing. I didn't hear nothing. I only thought I heard and seen as much as a thousand things. Well, I couldn't stay up there forever, so at last I got down, but I kept in the thick woods and on the lookout all the time. All I could get to eat was berries and what was left over from breakfast. By the time it was night I was pretty hungry. So when it was good and dark, I slid out from shore before moonrise and paddled over to the Illinois bank about a quarter of a mile. I went out in the woods and cooked a supper, and I had about made up my mind I would stay there all night when I hear a plunkety-plunk, plunkety-plunk, and says to myself, horses coming, and next I hear people's voices. I got everything into the canoe as quick as I could, and then went creeping through the woods to see what I could find out. I hadn't got far when I hear a man say, we better camp here if we can find a good place. The horse is about beat out. Let's look around. I didn't wait, but shoved out and paddled away easy. I tied up in the old place and reckoned I would sleep in the canoe. I didn't sleep much. I couldn't, somehow, for thinking. And every time I waked up I thought somebody had me by the neck, so the sleep didn't do me no good. By and by I says to myself, I can't live this way. I'm a-going to find out who it is that's here on the island with me. I'll find it out or bust. Well, I felt better right off. So I took my paddle and slid out from shore just a step or two, and then let the canoe drop along down amongst the shadows. The moon was shining, and outside of the shadows it made it most as light as day. I poked along well on to an hour, everything still as rocks and sound asleep. Well, by this time I was most down to the foot of the island. A little ripply cool breeze begun to blow, and that was as good as saying the night was about done. I give her a turn with a paddle and brung her nose to shore. Then I got my gun and slipped out and into the edge of the woods. 
I sat down there on a log and looked out through the leaves. I see the moon go off watch, and the darkness begin to blanket the river. But in a little while I see a pale streak over the treetops and knowed the day was coming. So I took my gun and slipped off towards where I had run across that campfire, stopping every minute or two to listen. But I hadn't no luck somehow. I couldn't seem to find the place. But by and by, sure enough, I catched a glimpse of fire away through the trees. I went for it, cautious and slow. By and by I was close enough to have a look, and there laid a man on the ground. It most give me the fantods. He had a blanket around his head, and his head was nearly in the fire. I sat there behind a clump of bushes, in about six foot of him, and kept my eyes on him steady. It was getting gray daylight now. Pretty soon he gapped and stretched himself and hove off the blanket, and it was Miss Watson's Jim. I bet I was glad to see him. I says, Hello, Jim, and skipped out. He bounced up and stared at me wild. Then he drops down on his knees and puts his hands together and says, Don't hurt me, don't. I hain't ever done no harm to a ghost. I always liked dead people and, and done all I could for them. You, you, you go and, and get in the river again uh, while you belongs and, and, and don't do nothing to old Jim. Uh, that is always your friend. Well, I weren't long making him understand I weren't dead. I was ever so glad to see Jim. I weren't lonesome now. I told him I weren't afraid of him telling the people where I was. I talked along, but he only sat there and looked at me, never said nothing. Then I says, It's good daylight. Let's get breakfast. Make up your campfire good. What's the use of making up the campfire to cook strawberries in such truck? Uh, but you got a gun, ain't you? Uh, then we can get something better than strawberries. Strawberries in such truck, I says. Is that what you live on? I couldn't get nothing else, he says. Why, how long have you been on the island, Jim? I come here the, the night after you was killed. What, all that time? Yes, indeedy. And ain't you had nothing but that kind of rubbish to eat? No, sir, n nothing else. Well, you must be most starved, ain't you? I reckon I could eat a horse. Uh, I think I could. Uh, how long have you been on the island? Since the night I got killed. No. Why, what has you lived on? But you got a gun. Oh, yes, you got a gun. That's good. Now, you kill something, from, and I'll make up the fire. So we went over to where the canoe was, and while he built a fire in a grassy open place amongst the trees, I fetched meal and bacon and coffee and coffee pot and frying pan and sugar and tin cups, and the nigger was set back considerable, because he reckoned it was all done with witchcraft. I catched a good big catfish, too, and Jim cleaned him with his knife and fried him. When breakfast was ready, we lolled on the grass and eat it smoking hot. Jim laid it in with all his might, for he was most about starved. Then, when we had got pretty well stuffed, we laid off and lazied. By and by, Jim says, But look at here, Huck, who was it that is killed in that shanty if it weren't you? Then I told him the whole thing, and he said it was smart. He said Tom Sawyer couldn't have get up no better plan than what I had. And I says, How do you come to be here, Jim? And how'd you get here? He looked pretty uneasy and didn't say nothing for a minute. Then he says, Maybe I better not tell. Why, Jim? Well, days reasons. But you wouldn't tell on me if I was to tell you, would you, Huck? Blamed if I would, Jim. Well, I believe you, Huck. I... I... run off. Jim. But mind, you said you wouldn't tell. You, you know you said you wouldn't tell, Huck. Well, I did. I said I wouldn't, and I'll stick to it. Honest Injun, I will. People would call me a low-down abolitionist and despise me for keeping mum, but that don't make no difference. I ain't a-going to tell, and I ain't a-going back there anyways. So now, let's know all about it. Well, you see, it is this way. Old Missus, that's uh, Miss Watson, she pecks on me all the time and treats me pooty rough. But she always says she wouldn't sell me down to Orleans. But I noticed there was a nigger trader round the place considerable lately, and I begin to get uneasy. Well, one night I creeps to the dough pooty late, and the dough weren't quite shut. And I hear old Missus tell the widder she gwine to sell me down to Orleans. But she didn't want to, but she could get eight hundred dollars from me, and it is such a big stack of money she couldn't resist. 
De widder she tried to get her to say she wouldn't do it, but I never waited to hear de rest. I lit out mighty quick, I tell you. I tuck out and shin down the hill and expect to steal a skiff to along the shore summers bout town. But dey was people a stirrin' yit, so I hid in the old tumble down cooper shop on the bank to wait for everybody to go away. Well, I was dere all night. Dey was somebody round all the time. Long about six in the mornin', skiffs begin to go by, and about eight or nine, every skiff dat went long was talkin' bout how your pap come over to the town and say you's killed. And these last skiffs was full o' ladies and gentlemen a goin' over for to see the place. Sometimes they'd pull up the shore and take a rest before they started across, so by the talk I got to know all about the killin'. I is powerful sorry you's killed, Huck, but I ain't no more now. I laid down under the shavings all day. I is hungry, but I weren't afeard, because I knowed old missus and de widder was going to start to the camp meetin' and right arter breakfast, and be gone all day, and they knows I goes off with the cattle about daylight, so they wouldn't expect to see me round the place, and so they wouldn't miss me till I had a dark in the evening. The other servants wouldn't miss me, cause they'd shin out and take holiday soon as the old folks was out in the way. Well, when it come dark, I took out up the river road, and went about two mile or more to where there weren't no houses. I'd made up my mind about what I was going to do. You see, if I kept on trying to get away foot, the dogs would track me. If I stole a skiff to cross over, they'd miss that skiff, you see, and they'd know about where I'd land on the other side, and why to pick up my track. So I says, a raft is what I's arter. It don't make no track. I see a light a coming around the pant by and by, so I waded in the shove a log ahead of me, and I swum more than halfway across the river, and got in amongst the driftwood, and kept my head down low, and kind of swum again the current till the raft come along. Then I swum to the stern of it and tuck a holt. It clouded up and was pretty dark for a little while, so I clum up and laid down on the planks. The men is all way yonder in the middle where the lantern was. The river was a rising, and they was a good current, so I reckoned that by four in the morning I'd be twenty-five mile down the river, and then I'd slip in just before daylight and swim ashore and take to the woods on the Illinois side. But I didn't have no luck. When we was most down to the head of the island, a man began to come aft with the lantern. I see it weren't no use for to wait, so I slid overboard and struck out for the island. Well, I had a notion I could land most anywheres, but I couldn't. Bank too bluff. I was most to the foot of the island before I found a good place. I went into the woods and judged I wouldn't fool with rafts no more, long as they moved the lantern round so. I had my pipe and a plug or dog leg and some matches in my cap, and they weren't wet, so I's all right. And so you ain't had no meat nor bread to eat all this time? Why didn't you get mud turkles? How you gwine get em? You can't slip up on em and grab em. And, and how's a body going to hit em with a rock? How could a body do it in the night? And I weren't going to show myself on the bank in the daytime. Well, that's so. You've had to keep in the woods all the time, of course. Did you hear him shooting the cannon? Oh, yes. I knowed they was out of you. I seen him go by here. Watched him through the bushes. Some young birds come along, flying a yard or two at a time and lighting. Jim said it was a sign it was going to rain. He said it was a sign when young chickens flew that way, and so he reckoned it was the same way when young birds done it. I was going to catch some of them, but Jim wouldn't let me. He said it was death. He said his father laid mighty sick once, and some of them catched a bird, and his old granny said his father would die, and he did. And Jim said, you mustn't count the things you are going to cook for dinner, because that would bring bad luck. The same if you shook the tablecloth after sundown. And he said, if a man owned a beehive, and that man died, the bees must be told about it before the sun up next morning, or else the bees would all weaken down and quit work and die. Jim said bees wouldn't sting idiots, but I didn't believe that, because I had tried them lots of times myself, and they wouldn't sting me. I had heard about some of these things before, but not all of them. Jim knowed all kinds of signs. He said he knowed most everything. I said it looked to me like all the signs was about bad luck, and so I asked him if there weren't any good luck signs. And he says, 
mighty few, and they ain't no use to a body. What you want to know when good luck's a-coming for? Want to keep it off? And he said, If you's got hairy arms and hairy breasts, and it's a sign that you's going to be rich, well, there's some use in a sign like that, case it's so fur ahead. You see, maybe you's got to be poor a long time first, and so you might get discouraged and kill yourself if you didn't know by the sign that you're going to be rich by and by. Have you got hairy arms and hairy breasts, Jim? What's the use ax that question? Don't you see I has? Well, are you rich? No, but I've been rich once, and going to be rich again. Once I had fourteen dollars. But I tucked to speculatin' <laughs> and got busted out. What did you speculate in, Jim? Well, first I tackled stock. What kind of stock? Why, live stock, cattle, you know. I put ten dollars in a cow. But I ain't going to risk no more money in stock. The cow up and died on my hands. So you lost the ten dollars? No, I didn't lose it all. I only lost about nine of it. I sold a hide and taller for a dollar and ten cents. You had five dollars and ten cents left. Did you speculate any more? Yes. You know that one-legged nigger that belongs to old Mr. Bradish? Well, he sought up a bank and say anybody that put in a dollar would get four dollars more at the end of the year. Well, all the niggers went in, but they didn't have much. I was the only one that had much, so I stuck out for more than four dollars. And I said, for if I didn't get it, I'd start a bank myself. Well, of course, that nigger wanted to keep me out of their business, because he says they weren't business enough for two banks. So he say I could put in my five dollars, and he'd pay me thirty-five at the end of their year. So I'd done it. Then I reckoned I'd invest the thirty-five dollars right off and keep things a-moving. There was a nigger named Bob that had catched a wood flat, and his master didn't know it. And I bought it off in him and told him to take the thirty-five dollars when the end of year come. But somebody stole the wood flat that night, and next day the one-legged nigger say the bank's busted. So didn't none of us get no money. What did you do with the ten cents, Jim? Well, I, I was going to spend it, but I had a dream. And a dream told me to give it to a nigger named Balaam. Balaam's ass, they call him for short. He's... One of them chuckleheads, you know. But he's lucky, they say, and I see I weren't lucky. The dream say, let Balaam invest the ten cents and he'd make a raise for me. Well, Balaam, he tucked the money, and when he was in church, he heard the preacher say that whoever give to the poor lend to the Lord, and bound to get his money back a hundred times. So Balaam, he tuck and give the ten cents to the poor, and laid low to see what was going to come of it. Well, what did come of it, Jim? Nothing never come of it. I couldn't manage to collect that money no way. And Balaam, he couldn't. I ain't going to lend no more money. Doubt I see the security. Bound to get your money back a hundred times, the preacher says. If I could get the ten cents back, I'd call it square and be glad or chanced. Well, it's all right anyway, Jim. Long as you're going to be rich again some time or other. Yes. And I is rich now, come to look at it. I owns myself, and I is worth eight hundred dollars. I wished I had the money. I wouldn't want no more. End of chapter 8